So the theorem is this: if you have all even vertices, then there, there, then you can construct both a uh, Euler path and an Euler circuit, both of them. If you have just two odd vertices and everything else is even, then you can construct an Euler path, but not an Euler circuit. And finally, if you have more than two odd vertices and any number of even vertices, but more than two, that's the key. And that's why they went around and asked you to put the degree on everything. And that's why they ask you to count up the number of odd vertices and the number of even vertices. Um, if you have more than two odd vertices, then there is no Euler graph that you can construct. It just can't be done. It's been proven it can't be done. So the answers um, for this one here, we have all kinds of odd vertices here, threes and fives and so on. If you count them, you have one, two, three, four. I might even ask how many odd vertices. You can see there are 10. So as soon as you know there are more than two, then you can't do a, an Euler graph, an Euler path, or nor an Euler circuit. So both of these in the first one are going to be no, because there's more than two odd uh, vertices. And the second one uh, turned out that there were just two odd uh, vertices and everything else was even. And because of that, there's exactly two, you can do um, an Euler path will work. So you want to answer yes. Is there an Euler path? Yes. But since there are some odd vertices, you can't do a circuit. You can't start and end at the same one. So yes, no on this one. And then on the last one, all of these are even. And since all of them are even, you can do a path or a circuit. So both of these would be yes on that last one. It doesn't make it easier, right? I mean, if you if you know you can construct a graph here, Euler's theorem says that it can be done, but it doesn't tell you how to do it. And so uh, it's always fun to try to do it. So you can try it on your own as well. If there is a path, and we know there's a path, but not a circuit to this one, we must start at one of the odd ones and we must end at the other odd one. So that's all we know going into the graph. So the idea of an Euler graph is that you want to go through and traverse every possible edge. And um, I didn't count the number of edges here, but uh, it's, it's interesting to do it. So the idea is to go through every edge without lifting your pencil from the paper. I'll try it on this one. All right, so, so here's the, uh, the first odd one. And here's the second odd one. And there are only two odd vertices. So I'm going to start at this one. And I'm going to end at this one. So let's see. Here, 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 here. Just kind of work my way down. There it is. Oops, did I get it? No, I have to come back down here. So it can be done, and uh, it's not always easy to, 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 to actually do it, however. And then in this last one, not only do you have a, um, a path, but since all of these are even, you should be able to traverse the entire thing, start and end at the same place. And you can choose any vertex you want. So if I choose, say, this one here, then I want to begin for a circuit and end at the same place. So let's see. I can't do any backtracking. You can get it. To label the path would be kind of a, uh, a hassle, but all right. So there are more definitions. Again, this is a uh, graph theory, so it's it's not usually a uh, topic that's covered in the mainstream math education in school, but uh, you may have seen some of this before. All right, the next uh, section, you can see these two here, 16.2.2 and 16.2.3, and that might be Wrong. This probably, I think, is 16.3.1. Anyways, these notes are in the at the e-learning site. Today uh, we have Euler, okay. So we talked about Euler graphs. The other main kind of graph we're going to look at is a Hamiltonian graph, um, or a Hamilton graph. 
And Hamilton is the, the same Alexander Hamilton uh, that's on the $10 bill, same one that um, developed one of those apportionment techniques that we, we did earlier in the course. So um, this uh, one of our founding fathers here had quite a lot of talents. Uh, paths and circuits mean the same thing, but for a Hamilton path, uh, you need to visit all of the vertices. You don't have to visit all the edges. So think about uh, the UPS guy who has a route and they receive a truckload of packages and they're given probably the GPS coordinates and the order in which to drive to each one of those stops. Now the UPS driver doesn't have to go down every street in the county. The UPS driver has to instead just visit every stop and they will hit some roads and some edges and they will not hit other roads or not other edges. But the key is that it has to pass through each vertex of the graph exactly once. So once you visit a vertex, you can't visit it again. It would be like the UPS guy dropping off a package at somebody's house and then coming back to that house just for fun. They're never gonna go back to that house because they've already delivered the, the package. If the path, the Hamilton path that visits every vertex, if it ends up back at the warehouse where it started, then that's a complete circuit. And we call it a Hamilton circuit. So like the Euler graphs, there are Hamiltonian paths or Hamilton paths and Hamilton circuits. Okay, so let's do a couple of examples. And I just have a couple of problems here. Find a Hamilton path that begins at A and ends at G. Now, when you count the vertices, you've got A, B, C, D, E, F, G. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There are seven vertices. You have to visit every single one. So every vertex will appear in your path. You need to start here. And a lot of times it's, in, and there's multiple paths. As we do this, we're gonna traverse out the path. We gotta make sure that we just visit every vertex. So we're gonna start at A and we're gonna end at G. And your path might be different than mine. There are multiple answers here. So I'm gonna indicate the path with a little arrow. I'm gonna to go to B first and label that first edge one. And then I'm go for, gonna go from B down to C, label that as well. And then there's only one place to go from there because I don't wanna revisit vertex B. So I'm gonna go down to E and uh, keeping in mind that I wanna end at G, I'm going to go up to D next. So that's gonna be the fourth edge, D. And then once here, I'm gonna come back down to F. And then finally, this is just a path. So it'll begin and end at different places and then G. So we're gonna indicate our paths by writing the consecutive vertices that we visit along the way. Find a Hamilton path that begins at A and ends at G. And then here it is labeled. This one, you're gonna begin at F and you're gonna end with the pair of vertices DF. So these last two are gonna be D and then F. Start at F, end at F. That is a circuit. The difference is that what, what do you have to visit? For an Euler graph, you have to visit every edge without backtracking. You can visit, in an Euler graph, you can visit the same vertex multiple times. However, in the graphs that we're studying today, for these, you have to ver visit every vertex exactly once. Unless it's a circuit, then it comes back and visits the, the, the beginning vertex at the end. But you don't have to visit every edge. Hamilton, visit every vertex. Euler, visit every edge. Traverse every edge. Okay, so F, and then we need to end at D, F. So we need to come back here as our last one. So um, I don't know, maybe I'll just go this way. Um, G, and then E, and then C, and then B, and then I have to go to A because my last two have to be D, F, six and seven. So that would be F to G to E to C to B and then to A and F to D and then F. So it ends in D, F. And it begins at F and it's a complete circuit. Notice in this graph, I didn't traverse these edges here. 
couple edges I just did not go down. Didn't go down that edge, didn't go down that edge, that edge. That, you don't have to visit all the edges in a Hamilton graph, graph. But you do have to visit all of the, the vertices. Okay, we can do a lot of, there's a special kind of a Hamilton graph um, or there's certain properties. Um, we can find a Hamilton graph, for example, uh, if you have this thing called a complete graph. Now a complete graph is a graph where there's an edge from each vertex to every other vertex. So if you have the vertex A, B, C, and D, A must go to B, A must have a, an edge to C, and A must have an edge to D. B must have an edge to A, to D, and to C. C must have an edge to A and B and D. You get the idea. There must be an edge from each vertex to every other vertex. If that happens, then you have what we call a complete graph. This one is complete. This one is not. Because there's no edge between B and C for one. And to be a complete graph, you would have to have an edge from B to C in addition to B to D and so on. You're missing too many edges here in a complete graph. Okay, so you can see we have a, after we define that definition, right, we, we write down the definition of a complete graph, uh, then we just have a couple of examples and we ask, is this a complete graph? Yes or no? Is this a complete graph? Yes or no? To be complete, each vertex has to have an edge to every other vertex. So just go through each vertex and make sure that there's an edge to every other vertex. So we start with A. A has to go to B. A has to go to C. There is no edge from A to C. There's a path from A to C, but not an edge, not a single one line edge to C. So not complete. All we have to do is to find uh, one missing edge and we can say that it's not complete. What is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so this is a septagon and there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different vertices in this graph. So each, each of those vertices must have an edge to the six other vertices. And so the degree of each one, if they're going to be a complete graph, well, one thing you can look for is that you have to have degree six. So A goes to G, A goes to F, A goes to E, A goes to D, A goes to C, and A goes to B. So A goes everywhere. You have to do the same thing for all of the other vertices. One, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. If you just count the degree, you'll see that the degree of every one is six. And then you just have to make sure that there's an edge to every other vertex. So this one is complete. So determine if the graph must have Hamilton's circuits, explain your answer. All right, so we'd say, um, yes, this one has Hamilton circuits because it's a complete graph. This one is not complete. However, we probably can find a Hamilton circuit. It's just that Hamilton circuits are guaranteed in a complete graph, but not guaranteed. So they said, determine if the graph must have Hamilton graph. And this one does not because it's not complete. But having said that, we may be able to, uh, yeah. So for example, let me draw a Hamilton path. <clears throat> if we start at B, we can go here, and then 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 here. And we visited every vertex. So this one does in fact have a Hamilton path. We just constructed it. But a Hamilton path or circuit is not guaranteed. In fact, this one does not have a, a circuit because it has too many odd vertices, I think. No, all even. But it's not a complete graph, so there's no way to get back to B. So there's no circuit. I don't see one anyway. Okay, if the graph must have Hamilton circuits, and this one does, then de determine the number of circuits, right? So if I just start here and go all the way the, around the outside, I'll have a Hamilton circuit because I will have visited every vertex, started and ended at the same place. How many circuits are there in a complete graph? Well, here's the result. The number of complete graphs, and I just found one by going all the way around here, what you do is you count the number of vertices. And in here, we have seven. So the number of circuits, Hamiltonian circuits, in this complete graph would be seven minus one, n minus one. The n is the seven. 
And that is a math function called factorial. 7 minus 1 factorial. And that's 6 factorial. And the factorial function just takes the number 6 and multiplies it by all whole numbers down to 1. 30, 120, 720. On your calculator, there's a function that, you know, for most of the smaller ones, you can calculate it yourself. But if you had like 13 factorial or something like that, you'll want to use the, the calculator. It's in the math menu, math menu there. It's over in the probability menu. And you'll see the exclamation point right there. That's our factorial. So if we wanted to evaluate 6 factorial, you type in the 6 and then math, and then go over to the probability menu of the math menu and select option four, six factorial. So we're looking at Hamiltonian graphs and we're looking at properties of them. And here's one, the number of complete graphs or the a number of Hamilton circuits in a complete graph. Yeah, so um, yeah, go ahead and do number 16 and 18. Put your answers in the chat. If you don't know, put a question mark. Start with 16. Determine the number of Hamiltonian circuits, Hamilton circuits, in a complete graph with a given number of vertices, four. With four vertices, the complete graph would look like you have four vertices, and there's an edge from every vertex to every other vertex. So that's what your graph would look like. How many Hamilton circuits are there? Okay, so got a lot of question marks, so let me answer this one, and then, I mean, basically, um, with the given number of vertices. So what they're giving you here with number four is they're saying there's a graph that has four vertices. For number 18, they're saying there's a graph with 13 vertices. And more specifically, they're saying this, envision the complete graph with 13 vertices or envision the complete graph with four vertices. How many different Hamiltonian circuits are there? And the number there are is given by this formula, n minus 1 factorial. And n is the number of vertices. So in number 16, where they say that there are four vertices, then the value of n that you're going to plug into this formula is equal to the number of vertices. So number of Hamilton circuits equals n minus 1 factorial. Or since n is 4 in this problem, that's 4 minus 1 or 3 factorial. All right, so this one you can do in your head is start with 3 and then multiply by all the whole numbers down to 1. So there are 6. So some of you had the answer 6. All right, do number 18 now. now imagine that you had a complete graph that had 13 vertices and there was an edge from every one of those 13 vertices to the other 12 vertices. Doesn't matter where you started. Yeah, you can go ahead and enter your uh, answer in the chat. It looks like, uh, yeah. So Wesley, it should do the same. I mean, it, it should it should give you that. Uh, so if you just took 13 times 12 times 11 times 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, there's the number that you all, ooh, hold on here. What did I type in wrong? Oops. <laughs> It's 13 minus 1 factorial, so it's 12 factorial. So 12 times 11 times 10 times 9 times 8. Yes, and that's the number that you were all giving me. Uh, or when I type in 12 and then go to the math menu and select the factorial button, you get the same number. Uh, now we're going to get into uh, something called a weighted graph. And a weighted graph is a graph where they attach numbers to each of the edges. And um, you can solve some, you know, interesting problems this way. So here's an example of a weighted graph. I'll zoom in a little bit on that. And notice it puts a number attached to each one of these edges, 190. And in application problems, these numbers will have meaning. So for example, it might be the case that if you're driving in a car, the distance between city A and city B is 190 miles. Or it might be the case that when you fly from one airport to the next, the airfare costs you $190. So these numbers will have meaning, meanings depending upon the particular context. But when you attach numbers to edges, we call this a weighted graph. It's got weights on. 
weights on the graphs, on the edges. We're leading up to some big theorem in this section, and you can see what it is. Uh, number 20 says, what is the weight of edge BD? So find B, find D, go along there and find the weight somewhere on here. It'll be labeled what the weight is. And it looks like the weight is seven. So we're just going to answer seven to that one. BD, BD. Okay. Now, in addition to just identifying the weight of one particular edge, we'll be asked to identify the weight of a path or the weight of a circuit. So in problem number 22, we have to traverse this entire circuit. Start at A, end at A, and then we're going to add up. Just imagine that you were driving from city A back to city A on a vacation and you visited city B, D, C, E along the way. How many total miles did you drive? So you're just going to add up all the weights along the way. So we'll start off from A to B. I'm going to run out of space here, but from A to B, it looks like it's nine. And then after B, we go to D. So I'll just, well, I won't draw it on here, but go here. And then after, and then we go down to D. Now D is over here. So we know the weight of BD is seven. So the distance between B and D is seven. So I'm just going to keep a running total of these weights. After D, we're going to go to C. So from D to C, and that weight is four. Now we're sitting at C. And then we're going to go up to E over here. And that weight is 11. And then finally, we're going to close our circuit and end back at A. So from E back to A, from E back to A. And that weight is 10. So um, we're going to be traversing one, two, three, four, five edges. Notice A, B, C, D, E. We cover all the vertices. We've hit them all. And so you just add up all these numbers, 20, 30, 41. So the weight of the whole circuit is 41. And this is how they, they do the, the UPS. I mean, they use some more sophisticated algorithms, but we will look at a couple of ways to identify the shortest circuit. And that's what the UPS company, FedEx, uh, this is what they're interested in. They want their drivers to drive the fewest possible miles on their route, yet still visit all of their drops, all of their houses, all of the businesses where they're delivering packages. So we're interested here in the minimum path. Okay, why don't, before we move on, go ahead and do number 24 and put your um, answer in the chat. Notice it's another Hamilton circuit, but it's a different one than the one in problem number 22. But you can see you still visit all of the vertices, all five of them, and you start at A and end at A. Okay, um, I agree. This is what I got. You'd have to add uh, 9 plus 5 plus 11 plus 4 plus 2. All right, and then we uh, finally get to a famous problem in mathematics called the, the traveling salesman problem, travel, you know, traveling salesperson problem. And um, what this problem involves is what we just talked about. Find the minimum path, the minimum, the optimal, they call it, which could be the maximum or the minimum weight. In this case, we're looking for the minimum weight or the minimum solution for a weighted graph. So answering the traveling salesperson problem means finding the shortest distance in a Hamilton circuit. I'm going to give you two methods. And those methods will combine a couple of the ideas that we've already talked about. And uh, one of them is the number of complete graphs or the number of uh, Hamilton circuits in a complete graph. So what we're going to do is we're going to just list all of the complete graphs and by brute force calculate the weight of each one and then sum them all up and the smallest cost is the answer to the problem. Now we can't do this method for graphs that have lots of uh, vertices. We have to keep it small because we have to write down all of the different circuits. So let's kind of review where we were. Here's the weighted graph. But if you'll notice, you have one, two, three, four different vertices. And if there are four vertices in a complete graph, there are n minus 1 factorial Hamilton circuits. And if n is the number of vertices, then we have 4 minus 1 factorial. I think we did this problem earlier. 
three factorial, which is six. There are six different unique Hamilton circuits. The brute force method of solving the minimum or identifying the sale or the solving the traveling salesman person is to find the minimum circuit, the minimum weighted graph. We know that there are six such graphs, such, such circuits. And they nicely gave them all to us here. Here are the six. These are the, the six and the only six. These are the ones, uh, you only have to do the ones that begin at A and end at A. Or you can do the ones that begin at B and end in B, but you don't have to do the ones that start at A and end at A, or, and then the ones that start at B and end in B. Here are the six that we're talking about. So for example, if you did another complete graph that began with B, and you went from B to C, and then C to D, and then D to A, and then A back to B, this is a Hamiltonian, Hamilton circuit. Starts at B, ends in B, and hits all the, the vertices. But the claim is that this one is already identified in this list. So look at the one that, begin, that, that has B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, and then cycles back to A. So this circuit is the same as this one. It uses the same letters, and there's no need, if we're going to traverse the same Hamiltonian path, and we're going to use the same five edges, is it five, one, two, three, the same, the same four edges. You know, we don't want to start at A and add the same four numbers, start at B and add the same four numbers, start at C and add the same four numbers. It's just replicating our work. So what we do is just start at one vertex and identify all the circuits that begin at one vertex and end at that same vertex. All of these other ones would be replica, or would be repeating what uh, what we did already in this work here. Okay, let's do it. Uh, the first one, the sum of the weights of the edges. So we start from A and we go to B and that weight is 20. And then from B to C, from B to C, that's 15. And then from C to D, C to D, it looks like it's 50. And then finally from D back to A, from D back to A, it looks like it's 30. So when we add these four numbers to get the total weight of that circuit, it adds up to, I think it's 115. So the sum of the weights of the edges, 115. Oh, I think what they wanted here is 20 plus 15 plus 50 plus 30 equals a total of 115. And I guess these numbers on the edges represent costs. So maybe it's the, uh, the cost to lay tile 70 feet or the cost to lay tile 20 feet or, or something like that, something about cost. All right, you just rep uh, replicate this five other times. It's tedious. It's called the brute force method because by brute force, we list all the possible circuits and just sum them up. If we had 13, a complete graph with 13 vertices. I don't think I wrote that one down. No. Anyways, it was that huge number that you uh, listed in the chat there. Can you imagine doing uh, 479 million of these rows? That's what we would have to do if we had a uh, graph that had 13 vertices. All right, the next one is A, B, D, C, A. It's different because even though we, we visit B first, in this graph, we visit C third. In this one, we go from B to D. So that's gonna give us a different weight. We still know that it's 20 from A to B, but now we're gonna to go to D from B to D, and that's only 10. And then once we're at D and we wanna go down to C, that's 50. And then from C, we go back to A, and that's 70. So we're gonna put 20 plus 10, plus 50, plus 70. And again, what we're looking for, we're gonna go through each one of these and do exactly the same thing. And the answer to the problem, the traveling salesman problem, is to find the minimum, in this case, cost, or minimum distance if you were in another context. But find the smaller. So we're gonna calculate all these numbers in this far right column, and then by inspection, we're just gonna look at the one that is the, and select the one that's the smallest of all of them. And this is called the brute force method. All right, next one is A, C, B, D, A. 
So now, instead of going to B first, we're gonna to go to C first. So we're gonna come down and do the 70 and then go over 15 from C to B and then from B to D, 10, and then from D back to A, 30. That's uh, 125. So far we have different weights for all of our circuits. The next one is ACD, BA from A to C, that's 70, from C to D, that's 50, from D to B, 10, and then from B back up to A is 20. 120, 130, 140, 150. It's very tedious, and so we'll only ask you to do this for graphs that have a small number of vertices. Next one is A, D, B, C, A, from A to D, 30, from D to B, 10, from D to C, 15, and from C back to A, 70. 30 plus 10 plus 15 plus 70. Again, we have the 125. All right, and the last one, using the brute force method, uh, A to D, 30, D to C, 50, C to B, 15, and then finally B back to A. That's 80, 115 again. All right, brute force method. All right, so then we look over all these numbers, and we ask the question, what is the smallest? And it looks like we have 115. It appears twice. So we would say that 115 is the minimum weight and hence the solution to this traveling salesman person uh, problem. All right, um, there is another method. Unfortunately, this other method, it doesn't always lead us to the smallest, to the shortest solution. So let's take a look. It's called the nearest neighbor method. And the idea is that we're still looking for this minimum number, 115. Sometimes the nearest neighbor method will give us that 115, other times it will not. So here's how you do the nearest neighbor method. And let's just say we're gonna do the same graph here and we're gonna start at A. The advantage of this technique is that there's only one um, weighted circuit that you have to add up. The downside is that the circuit that you end up with might not be the solution. All right, so let's take a look. We're gonna start at A and then you ask yourself the question, Where's my nearest neighbor? And nearest neighbor could mean nearest in terms of miles or nearest in terms of cost. What's the cheapest? So from A, you have a choice. You can go to B, you can go to D, or you can go to C. Of those three weights, which one is the smallest? See it? Even though the edge might not look the smallest, the smallest edge looks to be 30, but you need to consider the weights. So the nearest neighbor from A would be B because the distance from A to B is 20 and that's the smallest of the three different distances that we can use here. So the nearest neighbor is B and then we add up that distance to be 20. We're still looking for uh, a weighted graph here, a weighted circuit, a weighted Hamilton circuit. It's just that we have this method to, to find it this time. All right, now we're sitting at B. Now we can't return to A yet because we don't want to complete our circuit yet. We've got to visit C and B, C and D. So from B, we don't want to go back up to A, but consider the nearest neighbor of the choices that we have to D or to C. What's the nearest neighbor? Is it D or is it C? Well, the distance to D is 10 and the distance to C is 15. D is the nearest neighbor. So D will be the next one. And that distance is 10. All right, at this point, there's only one place that we can go because we still want a Hamilton circuit. We still have to visit all of the, the vertices. We haven't yet visited C. So C must come next. And then to complete the circuit, we have to go back to A. So we're really forced in these last two selections to choose what's left. Uh, D down to C is 50, and then C back up to A is 70. And when you add this total weight, you get 150. <laughs> so you can see, not only did it not give us the shortest path, it gave us the largest path. So this method doesn't always work, but you're going to be asked to use this nearest neighbor method on various problems. 
All right. So why don't you try it on problem number 40? Number 40 says use the nearest neighbor method, starting with vertex A. So we're going to start here. What's the nearest neighbor? Start with A, and you're going to end with A. But what are these other ones in here? So find an approximate solution, and then what is the total, they say, cost here? If you can't see that very well, I'll magnify it a little bit. So put your uh, total weight of your circuit in the chat. And if you don't know what we're doing, put a question mark. So identify the vertex that serves as the starting point. There it is. And then from the starting point, choose an edge to traverse such that it's the smallest edge, shortest edge, in this case, the lowest cost. There are five different vertices. So you're going to start with A and end in A. That's one. So then you're going to have two, three, four, five. So you're going to have four letters between the, the two A's. And the letters you have to use are the other vertices. So B, C, D, and E has to appear in some combination in here. Okay. Also include the weight. What is the weight of your minimum circuit or your minimum uh, of your weighted graph? All right. So the nearest neighbor is, uh, and it looks like everybody, well, some of you are going to D and some of you are going to E. Uh, let's see, 205, 185. Yeah, so I think you should probably go to D first, and that distance is 185. 185 is the shortest cost or the least cost or the shortest distance. So then we cross out D, and we never have to visit D again. But from D, we then have, we can't go back to A because that's where we started. We can either go to E or B or C. The nearest neighbor is the vertex that's the closest between 302, 360, and 320. 302 is the smallest, so yes, we go to E next. Right, you're not going to be able to read these numbers, but I'll give them to you. All right, now we've already visited D and E, so we don't want to go back there, but we are sitting, sitting at E. So our choices are, we can't go to A because that would complete our circuit. We can either go to B, or we can go to C. And between B and C, the nearest neighbor is the C, and that's 165. Now from here, the last two distances are determined because the only vertex other than A where we have to finish that did not get visited is B. So we have to go from C to B, and that's 305. And then we have to make the complete circuit, so we have to go back to A. And that's 500. So adding up all those numbers, the weighted graph is 1457. All right, so the nearest neighbor, this is how this, so the, the nice thing about this is there's only one answer. Uh, unless you happen to have uh, the nearest neighbor and, and there are two neighbors that have the same distance, like both of them is two or 200, then you can choose whatever one you want. But again, we don't know that this is the the answer to the traveling salesperson problem. There might be a different circuit among the, if there are five vertices, four factorial is 24. There's 24 different circuits. Um, one of those other 24 might be the, the minimum. Okay, uh, that pretty much concludes the first couple of sections. Uh, after the break, we're gonna look at trees. And I'll make sure that this one is up online uh, during that time. So let's take a break. Uh, 10 minutes. Uh, right now it's 3.40. So uh, let's come back at, uh, well, let's just go come, come back at 3.55. And we'll do this last, this last problem here on trees. Okay, so we're going to look at this, this last idea. And um, we're going to define what a tree is in the graph sense. And, and then look at um, this last theorem called Kruskal's algorithm that helps us to define the what we call the minimum spanning tree. It works a lot like a weighted graph because all of the edges will be labeled with a number. Uh, but all of the graphs that are in this section are, are called trees. And so we'll first define the tree, and then we'll go into uh, Kruskal's algorithm. <clears throat> we'll talk about what a spanning tree is and so on. Here's the definition of a tree. It consists of uh, several things. Uh, there is one and only one path joining any two vertices. So if you find that there's more than one path, 
that would connect one vertex to another, then it's not a tree. So for example, this one down here, if I wanted to get from A to D, I could go A to B and then to D, and I would have a path to, from A to D. But there's another path from A to D, and that's going this way, A to B to C to D. There are two paths that lead me from one vertex to the next. So if that happens, this graph right here is not a tree. This one is a tree because as we go from, um, if we wanted to go from say A to C, there's only one path and that's through B. If we wanted to go from A to B, there's only one path. If we wanted to go from A to D, there's only one path. Same thing from the starting at any vertex and going to any other vertex, there's exactly one path. So that's what this part of the definition means. That there's only one path joining any two vertices. Every edge is a bridge. Now remember what a bridge is? A bridge is an edge that if we remove it from the graph, it creates a disconnected graph. Two components that are not connected in any way. So, um, yeah, so number two here, if we remove the edge AB, then we've got two components of, that are disconnected. If we remove the edge AC, then we also have a disconnected graph because C would be on an island by itself and it wouldn't be connected in any way to the rest of the graph. So if you see a graph that if you remove an edge, any edge you remove is a bridge which creates a disconnected graph, then you're gonna have a, a tree. And the last thing is kind of more mathematical. If you have n vertices, then you're gonna have one fewer edge. So to check that out, in this graph here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, six vertices. If this is a tree, then we should have six minus one or five edges. One, two, three, four, five. And we count them up and we do have five. So all three of these properties must hold. And if they do, you have a tree. So this one is a tree. This one here, you have four vertices, one, two, three, three edges. So it satisfies this last property. If you have four edges, you have one fewer, or if you have four vertices, you have one fewer or three edges. Each one of these edges is a bridge. Remove it, you create a disconnected graph. Oh, hold on. <laughs> um, I didn't see this piece over here. All right, so this is a disconnected graph to begin with. And since it's disconnected, it's not a tree. A tree is a graph that is connected, has no circuits. This one has a circuit, so it's not a tree. This one's not connected, so not a tree. All right, so this is the one I wanted to do. This one has four vertices and three edges. Every edge is a bridge. You remove it, you create a disconnected graph, and there's only one path connecting one vertex to any other vertex. So in this group, we've got number two and number six. Those are trees and the other two are not. This one because it's not connected, this one because it has a circuit. All right, so what we're eventually going to do to, to apply the theorem at the end of this section is we're going to start with a graph that is definitely not a tree, but we're going to create a spanning tree. And the tree would, a uh, spanning tree would involve, would include all of the vertices of the original graph, but then it would also create a bunch of edges, as many edges that you could, as you could possibly add, but the spanning tree would then have to be a tree. So just imagine that um, all of these are subgraphs of the graph. I'm just going to draw one over here. All right, so let's assume that this is the original graph where we have A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. This one has circuits all over the place. So it's certainly not a tree. All of these include the same. There are three different examples. One, two, three. Uh, they say this is the original graph, but I'm just going to this one here. <clears throat> this one's not a graph because it has a circuit, but these two are trees. This one is not, these two are trees. All three of these are subgraphs of this one here. These two are subgraphs of this one. 
because they have the same vertices kind of oriented in the same way. So we first talk about a subgraph, which is a subset of, it must include all the vertices, but doesn't have to include all the edges. And then a spanning tree is one of these subgraphs that is a tree. So both of these would be spanning trees because of the original graph, it has all the vertices and it is a tree. Then what we're gonna do is we're going to find the minimum spanning tree. All right, but before we get there, let's take a look at each of these. Number 18. So for these exercises, find a spanning tree for each connected graph because many spanning trees are possible. Your answers might ne not necessarily match the one that uh, is given as the answer in the back, uh, but just make sure that your spanning tree is connected, doesn't have two different components that are not connected in some way, and that does not contain any circuits. Each edge is a bridge and one fewer edge than vertex. So first of all, in part in 18, notice that there's one, two, three, four, five, six different vertices. So the tree must have one fewer edge. So if there are six vertices, the tree must have five edges. All right, let's orient these um, vertices in the same way as you see in um, number 18 there. All right, so here's the original graph. Notice how the uh, vertices are oriented. Now, I can't add the, um, the edge DF here to a spanning tree because DF is not an edge on the original graph. So this particular graph has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different edges, but the spanning tree that we're looking for can only have five edges. So of the seven edges that I have here, I have to get rid of two of them and do so in a way that gets rid of all circuits and um, we have to have a connected graph. So there's lots of different ways to do it. Um, how about if I just do this one here? Notice that all of the, the vertices uh, have an edge going out of them. It's not a disconnected graph in any way. If I, move any, if I remove any one of these edges, you create a disconnected graph. There are one, two, three, four, five edges. So it meets all the conditions. So here's one example of a spanning tree for this one here. There are lots of other possibilities. That's just one of them. In number 20, this one here, I'm going to write down my five vertices here. Now what you'll notice about um, number 20 is it's a complete graph. There are four different edges coming out of each vertex. And those edges go to the different, the four different um, vertices. So this is a complete graph. And so you just have to connect them together. I'll draw this one a little bit different. Here's a tree. That one right there is a tree. Remove any one of them, any one of those edges, and you create a disconnected graph. Uh, therefore, each one of those edges is a bridge. There are four edges and five vertices. And this is a feature of a tree, one fewer edge than vertex. And maybe your picture looks different. Just make sure that you don't have any loops or any cycles, circuits. All right, so for example, I couldn't add this one because that would create a circuit, ACD. And then, so now that we're in, we know how to create a spanning tree. Now we're going to look at the minimum, we're gonna consider the minimum spanning tree. So you're gonna have a graph and the weights are going to be listed on all of the different edges. And what you're going to want to do is to find the minimum spanning tree. So of all the possible trees that spanning trees that you can come up with, what is the one with the smallest weight? And that's called the minimum spanning tree. Uh, think about the problem this way. Uh, we just got a snowstorm and everybody's going to Delta College and they want to make sure that students do not have to walk in the snow to get from any one place um, on campus to any other place. And so they have to shovel the driveways and they wanna do it with the least effort. So what they'll do is they'll create a minimum spanning tree. And we know that in a tree, there is a path from any one building to any other building. And so they can actually find the minimum spanning tree and that would tell them the minimum amount of snow plowing they would need to do. So that 
a student can get from one place to any other place on campus or even any other place outside uh, without having to, to walk through the snow. All right, so let's look at um, the minimum spanning tree. And uh, there is a method to find it, and it's called uh, Kruskal's algorithm. And here it is. And without reading it all, I'm just going to uh, demonstrate it and then, and then maybe ask you to go through a problem. Here's how it works. When you're done, you're going to have a tree. So you have to make sure that every vertex is in your tree. And you're going to look at all the weights. So let's try to work on this example right here. Look at all the weights. This is a, it looks to be a complete graph. There is a weight on every single edge. Go through and look at all of them and find the smallest weight. This is how Kruskal's algorithm works. Step number one, find the edge with the smallest weight in the graph. If there's more than one, pick one at random. Mark it in red. All right. I think any other color would, would, net, would work as well. All right, do you see it? What's the smallest, 14? No, 12, here it is, 12. So this is gonna be one edge of your tree. Now remember, you can't form any circuits in a, in a tree. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're then gonna go identify the next smallest weight. 24, 22, 28, 31, 35, 21, 23, 26, 14. Now, can I add 14 to the spanning tree? And the answer is yes, because if I add 14, I do not create a circuit. So 14 is part of my minimum spanning tree. You just continue in this way until you've hit every single vertex. All right, what's the next smallest number? 21, I'm seeing 21. There's 21. And that is the smallest. So I'm gonna select that one. And I can select that one because it doesn't create a circuit of any sort. All right, well, the only one we have left is B. We got to get to B. What's the next smallest number in the group? 22. Well, and here's 22, and I can actually draw this one without creating a circuit. So there it is, and we're done. And this is the minimum spanning tree. So typically, they're going to ask us to give the total weight. And so we're going to add up 12 and 14 and 21 and 22. Add those together, and that would be the minimum spanning tree. All right, that's pretty much it. Why don't you try one? Find the minimum spanning tree. Uh, you can see that there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. There are 10 vertices, so that means in your spanning tree, you're going to have nine edges. So you're going to be adding up nine numbers. These numbers, um, this is a bike trail. And um, let's see, the layout of a bike trail system to be installed between towns. All right, so these are two towns, and there's 26 miles between town A and town B. The edges indicate all the possible choices for building the trail. The weights show the distances in miles between the bike trailheads connecting the towns. And then it says use Kruskal's algorithm to determine the minimum mileage. If we knew the minimum mileage, then we would know roughly how much building this trail would cost us. Okay, I'll do the first one. What's the smallest number that you see? The smallest weight? Is there a two on there? Yeah, there it is, two. So this is the first one we select right here. All right, eight more to go. I'll give you a couple minutes. Go ahead. When you're done, add up your weight and write it in the chat. If you don't know what, what to do, then you can write a question mark. I will add here that um, the next edge that you add does not have to be connected to the first one that you added. So if you, is six the next one? Anything less than six? Okay. So notice I'm gonna add six here. I'm gonna add this edge which is six, and it's not connected to this one. Eventually it will be connected, but it's not connected now. All right, so we already have the two and the six. Um, the next smallest number is the eight. So we're gonna add that one. We can add that one because it doesn't create a, a loop or a circuit. What's the next one? 
Oh, got an answer. 139, maybe. 115. Is 15 the next one? 15. Anything less than 15? Nope. So now we can, can we use 15? Does that create a circuit of any sort? Nope. So there it is. There's another edge. One, two, three, four. We got to have nine. What's the next smallest number? The smallest weight. 17. Can we add 17? Does adding 17, that edge, does it create a loop, a circuit? Nope. No circuit yet. 17. All right. What's the next smallest weight after 17? Good. 22. Can we add 22? We cannot. And we can't add 22 because if we did, we would create a circuit. And trees do not have circuits. So we can't add the 22. So we go up to the next number. What's the next largest number after 22? Okay. 25. That's this one here. Is that the one? We can't add this 25 because it would create this circuit here. Oh, but here's another one. Can we add this 25? Now, if both of them would work, then we could randomly select one. But this one doesn't work because this 25 would create the circuit B, C, E, D. So we can't add that 25, but we can add this one. Still a tree. We have one, two, three, four, five, six. We need to add three more edges, and we have to connect up with I, H, and A yet. We don't have a path to A yet. We don't have a path to H yet. <clears throat> okay, what's larger than what's the next largest number to 25? Uh, 26? 